Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic. Positronic. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to talk about the latest episode of the Orville, which was called Mor uh, Mortality Paradox. And as it opens, Tala is returning from vacation and reports having detected recent Kalong activity in the area. Just after that, Isaac picks up a bunch of signals coming from a planet that's supposed to be uninhabited and like a, just a rock in space, like a big desert planet. So the Orville heads there, and when their hails are ignored upon arrival, Captain Mercer takes a shuttle to the surface, which I think was kind of rash, but okay. Upon arrival, the planet still seems to be uninhabited, but is now full of forests that wouldn't have been there. It's a desert planet. And it's a little curious, too, because they thought they were going to run into, like, huge cities from based on the readings they were getting. Anyway, after coming to a clearing in the woods, the landing party discovers what would appear to be a 21st century American high school, where they're picking up several hundred life signs. So they go in there, and suddenly communication with the ship is cut off, and the door that they came through to get in it closes behind them, locking them in just before the hallway is populated with tons of apparent 21st century human teenagers. Looking for a way out, the crew splits up and explores the building, and in the process, Gordon gets separated from the group and taken into the bathroom by a bunch of jocks who seem to think that he's a particular person who owes money to someone they know, whose name I forget. But anyway, Randall, I think it's Randall. When some mean girls won't let the rest of the crew sit with them at Bordas's request, they move on, but only after Gordon, who has now been reconnected with the group, tells Bordas to tell the spokesgirl at the table that she has a five head, which is kind of funny. When either recess or the end of the school day comes and the kids all exit the school, the crew is able to go outside finally, at which point they head to what looked like a track meet, where they soon meet this Randall guy. And it turns out he's not a guy, but like a gigantic troll type thing who almost eats Gordon, but from whom they manage to escape back into the school building, which suddenly becomes an airliner traveling at 30,000 feet. And at this point, Gordon says, you know, when that troll monster beast thing had me in its grasp for a second, I felt like I wasn't in my own body. So it's kind of weird. Anyway. When a second landing party arrives on the planet in another shuttle, they find a desert scape, just like they would expect to find. So it was really kind of weird. Back on this airplane, when the flying gets rough, Gordon decides to go up to the cockpit and is able to get in there when Tala straight, straight up just removes the reinforced door and they find no one flying the plane. So he takes the controls and soon finds himself having to glide the plane to a landing because all power goes out. As they're crashing, we see the captain experience that same momentary trance thing, just like Gordon did, for a brief second. And I'm starting to think that whoever's behind these scenarios is putting people through their paces in this way, scaring the crap out of them to get something from the reaction and what they experience neurologically and biochemically in that moment. And everything that's happened in this episode so far especially considering this, reminds me very much of the Talosians from Star Trek and what they would do to people, you know, that found themselves on Talos IV, up to and including whoever seems to be feeding off what the crew is experiencing, because the Talosians kind of did that. Anyway, we'll talk about that more later. After the plane crashes, before almost falling over a ledge on a high mountain, the crew is able to get out of the plane, which is now completely unoccupied. But when they exit, they walk right into a Mocklin morgue, even though the plane crashed in a desolate earth mountain region. <laughs> when Tala pushes one of the beeping buttons for some reason, the pods containing the corpses all open. And when Bordas approaches one of them, the corpse comes to life and picks him up and starts strangling him, at which point he goes to that, you know, through that mental haze thing before being freed from its grip. Following that, a weird door opens, revealing a staircase, which the landing party descends seemingly into a black void. When they reach the bottom and go through a door, they find themselves outside in some kind of a lake area, which is apparently a recreate, which is apparently a recreation of a spot on Tallis planet, which 
alerts them to the fact that it must be an illusion because if they were really on that planet, the gravity there would have killed all of them but her. And when they see what appears to be a signal coming from the other side of the lake, all of them except Bordas and the captain board a raft in order to cross the lake to see what's sending it. As they're crossing the lake, the signal that they were chasing disappears and they're attacked by a giant something or other under the lake, which grabs Kelly and pulls her under. And before, the, you know, before Tala can rescue her, which she eventually does, both she and Kelly experience that whole mental thing that the rest of the crew has been experiencing, the rest of the landing party has been experiencing, you know, that feeling like they're having an out-of-body experience. Back on shore, a very large medieval castle-type door appears, and Mercer says, no, we're not playing this game anymore. He yells out to the entity or entities that are messing with them and says, we're done, and instead of walking through the door, they walk off into the woods and find a cave within which there's a device generating holograms over a great distance. When the captain destroys it, they immediately see that the planet is actually as they expected to find it, according to Union records, and they're back at their shuttle. Back on the Orville, they're looking at the doctor's scans of them, and it turns out that the device they destroyed was able to scan their brains and use the information to generate holograms that, you know, the holograms they found themselves interacting with and were basically, you know, which they're basically being menaced by. Upon examination of the fragments of the device that was generating the holograms, it would appear that the Kalon had planted it there for the purpose of maybe experimenting with something that they could use to control the Union's perception of reality in order to be able to easy overtake, you know, easily overtake them. So they decide to, after consulting with the Admiral back at Union headquarters, they decide to rendezvous with another Union ship so they can turn over the, fragment, the fragments so they can be studied. And when they get to the rendezvous point, Isaac tells them, hey, those ships that look like Union ships are actually not Union ships, they're Kalon ships. And then they proceed to attack the Orville, at which point it would seem that even this is all some kind of illusion and that they're still trapped on the planet. Because we see Lamar, a second later, still in charge of the Orville, still trying to find the landing party, and instead finds Tala on her shuttle upon return from her vacation, which Lamar says has already happened, which means that the Tala that the landing party thinks they're with down on the planet is not actually her. And that, the, that they're in a fake simulation on the Orville and they're not actually with her. Back in that simulation, the Kalon are kicking the Orville's ass and the captain orders an evacuation. And just before a Kalon ship can ram them and destroy them, they realize they're in a simulation because it freezes around them. And a super hot alien lady who looks like she came from the planet Tron reveals herself to have been pretending to be Tala. This next part's pretty cool. It turns out she's from that planet that was phasing in and out of the universe that the Union exists in every so many centuries on which a religion ended up developing around Kelly a couple of seasons ago. And it would appear that they've advanced about 50,000 years in the last couple of Earth years and got to the point where they pretty much became immortal and as such needed to do all of this in order to read the minds of other beings at the moment when they think they're going to die in order to experience what it feels like to be mortal. Not only because they wanted to experience that, but also because they just had nothing better to do. And this whole thing is, you know, you could call it an homage, but it's also kind of like a ripoff of the cage because that's exactly what happened to the Telosians, except for the immortal part. They became so advanced that they stopped being able to do anything physical and began to use their power of illusion to control other beings so that they could get from them what they needed, which in their case was the ability to do physical labor if I'm remembering correctly anyway. Of course, the, the landing party is very indignant about what was done to them, but the lady says, well, you were never in any real danger, so chill out and I'm gonna go now, but we'll meet again. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Finally, back aboard the orbital for real, the landing party muses on the idea of not being able to conceptualize one's own death, which the captain suggests they actually have in common with the immortal beings just because it's an inconceivable concept, non-existence. And 
the captain indicates during this conversation that he'd live forever if he could for the simple reason that he just wants to see what happens, which is interesting because that's how I feel about it. Like, I think, okay, when I go, I want it to be in some kind of disaster that takes the whole world out with me. <laughs> because if I gotta go, I don't like the idea of y'all being able to continue on without me and without me <laughs> being able to see what happens in the future <laughs> after my death. That's really what I don't like about it. Anyway, I enjoyed this episode a lot. It was a massive thrill ride. It was a mind bender. And I liked how in the end, the entity responsible for what was happening was a race we had encountered before but at a less advanced stage, rather than something they pulled out of their butt through coming up with a completely new species that would have been, you know, I guess interesting also, but I guess I'm saying that since either choice would have been completely valid, it was cool to see a connection to a previous episode. But I'm a little let down by the end because it was very simplistic. It was a very simple explanation of, you know, what had happened, which, is not uncommon in science fiction or even Star Trek, for example, which, you know, the Orville is modeled on, but it was kind of a deus ex machina, which I'm not really a fan of. And I'm also annoyed by how much a ripoff it is of the concept of the Telosians. But other episodes of other shows, you know, Star Trek, etc., have ripped off previous things from other franchises like a million times. So this isn't a new thing. In fact, the Orville's done this before you know, stories that have been done on other shows with their own spin on it. But I still found it disappointed because they could probably have come up with something completely new to explain everything that happened. They just didn't. But I don't know, I guess that's okay because they were trying to make a particular point, which is that mortality is, you know, weird. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I guess I can let it go. But yeah, this was a wild episode, a wild ride and a mind bender, like I said, and it was really well done. And, you know, not surprisingly, I enjoyed it because I enjoy the Orville. It's a really good show. So, yeah, I, I like this episode. I'm looking forward to the next one. I, of course, will be here with a review of that episode once it is released. Until then, I'm going to get out of here. And as always, I wish you peace and long life.